Thank you all for coming to my talk today. Um, as she just said, my name is Janet. I'm a data scientist at Zymergen, and I'm here today to tell you about programming microbes using Python. I've just tweeted out my slides, um, or you can grab them on bit.ly at programming microbes. So, as you all know, we've been using microbes to produce valuable substances like beer and wine for millennia. It may surprise you to hear that in recent decades, we've learned to produce a much broader diversity of molecules using these microbes. For example, we can produce a number of different drugs, including synthetic insulin, using microbes like E. coli and yeast. We can produce a variety of flavors and fragrances that are in products we're all quite familiar with. And increasingly, we're finding applications for biological materials in products or in processes like electronics manufacturing that are rather high tech. This is where Zymergen comes in, because for alcohol, you can get microbes that naturally produce it. But more and more, for the kinds of chemicals we want to make, you have to genetically alter the organisms to get them to produce the compounds you're interested in. If you're wondering, that's not an accurate depiction of how DNA editing works, but I'll show you a picture that's slightly more realistic later. So the demand for the chemicals that I've just shown you is enormous. Um, sales are around $80 billion per year. And so to keep up with that demand, we grow these microbes in really large tanks that can be several stories tall and take uh, up to hundreds of thousands of liters of liquid in them. Of course, Zymergen can't do experiments at that scale. So instead, we scale down our experiments and try to do them in as fast a way as possible. Our high throughput testing looks something like this. We first need to make variants of microbes where each microbe is running a different genetic program. They all have different genetic compositions. Next, we grow and test these organisms in parallel using small volumes that we parallelize, such as having 96 well plates like this. We can use these to measure the performance and figure out which strains are improved relative to the parent strains that we built them from. And then when we find candidates that are promising, we can submit those into larger scale benchtop reactor tests where we have a more controlled environment and more rigorously test how well these microbes perform. Every once in a while when we find a real winner, we can send them to the big tanks and run the multi-million dollar experiment to see how they really perform at scale. Our computational and challenges at Zymergen are a few things. First, we're designing algorithms that help us design large numbers of microbial variants that are intended to have increased performance levels. We also need to automate the collection of data and the ability to link different performance levels with the genetic compositions of those strains. And we need to identify statistically significant ex uh, improvements, which can be tricky with experimental data. We also want to predict large scale performance from smaller scale experiments, such as the prediction of the tank performance from the plates. All this is made possible by Zymergen's intense investment in robots and automation. And this movie gives you some, a flavor of some of the things we do with robots. So the one on the top left is a robot that's picking up liquid from wells in one plate and moving them to another. The one in the middle is picking up different genetic variants from a plate that you might want to test. And the one on the right is inserting a plate into a machine to measure the performance of the selected strains. Now, I realize this is not a genetic engineering conference, and so I wanted to pause and explain what we do in terms that are more familiar to this sort of crowd. We often start with a human interpretable idea about what we want to try, like let's perturb gene X, because that gene is known to be important for producing a chemical we're interested in. The first thing we need to do is compile that human interpretable idea into the low level language of DNA. And we do this using a program that we built in-house in Python that's called Helix. Helix also helps us generate the instructions to build that loop of DNA and to check that it was correctly constructed. We then need to apply this DNA into a new organism, and this looks actually a lot like git patch, where there's a region of sequence similarity before and after the change we're encoding that specifies where it gets integrated in. We take these modified organisms and we put them in these plates, 
which we can think of as being like unit tests because they're the smallest and fastest tests we can do. They give you an early indication of how a unit's performing, but it's known to not reflect how it will actually be used at scale. We can then do the more intensive integration tests once in a while, and these are tests that are designed to be much more reflective of how the, co uh, how the code or the organism will work at scale. And just like code, we get to commit the physical organism to our freezers and its genetic composition. And this means that later we can check out those organisms from the freezer for more experiments or check out their genetic compositions to do data analysis. Similarly, we can take two genetic compositions and do something like a git diff to figure out which genetic edits caused an interesting change in performance. So, our work at Zymergen has some challenges that aren't typical in the average technology company, and I wanted to highlight some of those themes. The first is that the DNA search space we're optimizing in is huge. The average microbial genome contains about 4, 000, er, <laughs> 4 million characters of DNA, and those can be organized into a few thousand different genes to simplify the representation. But despite great advances in biology, we still only have good understanding about, for about half of those genes for what their function is. And so it's really like we're optimizing a code base where we have kind of vague understanding of what all the functions are. To give a, you an idea of what it's like to explore this experimentally, imagine you want to perturb every gene in a genome for a genome with 4,000 genes. If you only wanted to look at single perturbations to genes, then you'd only have to build 4,000 strains and do 4,000 experiments, and that's easy for Zymergen. However, Zymergen often wants to build strains with many, many, many more changes in them, and the combinatorics of the space we're exploring gets to be, it qu quickly outgrows what we can do experimentally. So if you wanted to try combinations of six gene edits and you wanted to explore that space exhaustively, you'd have to build 4,000 choose six strains, and that would lead you to 10 to the 17th different experiments you want to run. And now, even if we could run experiments at a rate of one per second, it would still take us more than 10 to the 10th years to explore that space. And that's the age of the universe, so we need to do something smarter, and that motivates why we're investing so heavily in machine learning to design our strains. Another aspect of what makes genome optimization hard is that we can't just simulate. So if you've been following the news in artificial intelligence last year, you'll be familiar with the idea that um, we can use algorithms that can play themselves at games like Go, and that uh, this can help train an algorithm to beat even great Go champions. Of course, these simulations require a very, or these, <laughs> this strategy requires very accurate simulations of your environment, which for this would be the game of Go. And so you might think we could apply this to microbes, but microbes, despite their small size, are actually much more complicated, and there was no such simulation that we can use. Another aspect is this phenomenon called epistasis, which is the fact that combinations of genetic edits can have unpredictable effects. So you might think that if the interesting gene X is important for the producing the chemical you're interested in, that increasing the expression level might help produce more of your chemical. However, bad things can happen. I'm not a fan of red meat, actually, but imagine you're in a hamburger producing factory and your job is to optimize the process. And you notice there's the key step of patty forming where people have been putting together these patties by hand. And you find out about this amazing new machine that's gonna increase your rate of patty forming by a thousand fold. And so you think this is awesome, we're gonna get this machine and we're gonna speed up our operations a thousand fold. Well, if your downstream operations aren't set up for this increased rate of patty formation, you could quickly overwhelm your factory floor with piles of raw meat, and nobody wants that. Oddly, this is actually a really good analogy for some principles in engineering microbes, because that hamburger meat is a good analogy for a chemical in a cell, where you might need high rates of reaction going through a series of reactions, but if you don't have the downstream reaction set up to handle the increased supply of an important chemical, you can accumulate that chemical and it actually can kill the cell. 
So this is just one flavor of epistasis, and there's many kinds in biology that make our optimization challenging hard, our optimization challenge hard. Another aspect is that we are balancing two objective functions that are really at odds. On the one hand, we need cells that are happy and healthy so that when we put them in those big tanks, they can grow and divide and fill up those large volumes. But on the other hand, we need cells that can produce a lot of chemical because ultimately that's why we're growing them. And to give some context about how hard we push this balance, we often can make microbes that can produce 90% of their theoretical maximum, which, going back to the cow analogy, would be like feeding a cow 100 pounds of grain and getting out 90 pounds of butter. So this balance is important, and we want to push it really hard. That's it for cow analogies. The last aspect of our challenge is that our experiments at Zymogen are unusually expensive and time consuming compared to other data science teams. So if you're at a more traditional technology company, like maybe a web analytics company, your experiment could be as simple as revealing two different versions of a website. And you might launch that experiment, and within a day, you could have millions of independent observations about which option worked better. At Zymergen, on the other hand, for every idea we want to test, we have to build a living organism and measure the amount of chemical it can produce. And so as a result, our process takes orders of magnitude more time and money. And this affects some of our strategies as well. So to recap the challenges, we have this large genome that we're trying to optimize, and we have only actually vague understanding of how all the pieces work. We don't have access to accurate simulations, and so we can't just jump on some of the reinforcement learning trends. We're balancing multiple objective functions that are all at odds because they're all very resource demanding for the cells. And we have these expensive and time consuming experiments. That's not to say that Zymergen doesn't have solutions, and this crowd will be happy to hear that a lot of our solutions lean heavily on Python. In, in particular, we are trying to bring together biological information with experimental results on how our strains perform to produce predictions about which genetic edits will help. We, like we talked about, we compile these ideas into DNA, and then we patch them into organisms which gives us new data to do analyses and derive results from. And I really want to highlight how important Python is for keeping this moving at our place. We're going to focus the rest of the talk on my area as a data scientist, which is the combination of biological features and experimental results to make predictions about what we should build next. In particular, our data science team is building out a strain recommendation platform that looks something like this where again, we're bringing together biological information with experimental results to make models, and we use the models to actually produce edit recommendations, which are called such because we're delivering them to scientists to choose which of them they want to build. These recommendations generate new data, and then our data science team has two additional steps we need to clean up the data for feeding it back into our loop. The first is removing of experimental outliers, which is natural and experimental processes. And also, we need to normalize the data because there can be variation by batch and across time. Again, Python is essential for what we do. Like any data science team, we use pandas everywhere. We use scikit-learn for our recommendation models and for helping with outlier removal. We can support our models and recommendations with TensorFlow. And we use PyStand to normalize our data. All of this happens continuously and in an automated way by support with Airflow. So we're going to spend the rest of the talk on an area I've been working on the most recently, which is how we can extract machine learning features from biological information. Because again, we need to explore in our search space as efficiently as possible. And in particular, we're going to focus on metabolism. So metabolism describes the set of chemical reactions in the cell which is a natural word because we call the individual chemicals metabolites. You can write a chemical reaction in the style I've shown here, the style you've probably seen in your chemistry classes, or you can write it in a graphical notation. And when you write it in this graphical notation, it becomes easy to assemble these metabolic maps, which you can think of as being a lot like a Google street map. 
and that the lines connect interesting places you might want to go, and the dots are places of interest, where for a cell, the place of interest is actually a chemical. So this is a cartoon of metabolism, but actually metabolism is quite complex. And this is just a screenshot of the upper corner of a poster you can order that shows the topology of metabolism. As you can see, there's a lot of reactions, and the topology is actually quite complicated. And so as important as this information is for our data science needs, we clearly need a way to extract some information from it that's more amenable to traditional machine learning techniques. Fortunately for us, there's this package called CobraPy that we can use. And so I'm going to walk through an example of extracting features using CobraPy. In particular, let's pretend we wanted to make MSG, which is the sodium form of glutamate, monosodium glutamate. Glutamate is actually one of the 20 natural amino acids and is essential for our health and vitality. Um, it was originally isolated by extraction from, MS, er, from seaweed, <laughs> and then later they figured out how to hydrolyze it from wheat. But in the 1950s, some clever Japanese researchers figured out that if you grew the right microbe in the right conditions, it would actually produce glutamate really efficiently. And so this process actually took over the world production for MSG. Now, MSG uh, has some mixed perceptions from the public, and because of this, the marketing team has asked me to clarify that Zymergen does not currently work on MSG. But nonetheless, we're using it as our example. So going back to metabolism, this is a cartoon that shows a subset of the reactions, like in the previous metabolic map we showed. And here I've highlighted in green the route that you might take to convert a food like glucose or sugar into the chemical of interest, glutamate. I've colored the set of reactions that you could consider the most efficient, green, and these are called on pathway. And the remaining reactions that are left gray, you can call off pathway, because they're not on that most important route to the chemical of interest. Extracting these features is pretty easy in CobraPy. First, you specify what the metabolic map structure looks like, and then you specify an objective function that you want to solve for. This gives you access to the data about what the most efficient route is. In more detail, it looks something like this. The metabolic map you're specifying is actually, it's represented nicely as a map in the previous slide, but mathematically it's represented as this matrix where for every reaction, you're specifying which different metabolites are produced and consumed. You specify an objective function, for us it's glutamate production, and then you get out this reaction set of vector, or this reaction vector that describes those reaction rates. And in biology we call these rates fluxes, and this method is generally called flux balance analysis. Now getting these flux features is pretty easy, and in code it's just these few steps. You first load your metabolic model, which are specified in systems biology markup language notation, but ultimately are specifying the details of this matrix. You then find the reaction you're interested in optimizing for. You set the objective of that model to be that chemical of interest, or that reaction of interest. And then you use the built-in optimizer to find the most efficient route. This gives you an object where you can loop over the different reactions in the object, and you can write those results out to a summary. Now, we talked about one objective so far, which is optimizing for glutamate production, but we can actually loop over multiple objectives, and then that allows us to get a broader set of features. So if you just run the last few lines of code using different objectives, you can produce this matrix of flux features. These are directly useful for machine learning. They're in a friendly matrix format. Or you can refine these down into the kinds of labels we talked about earlier, like on pathway and off pathway. Or potentially other labels, like whether a gene is essential for the cell's survival. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a second. I thought you told me we can't use simulations for self-play and jump on the reinforcement learning bandwagon. Well, there's really two reasons that's true. The first is that we're really only modeling a subset of the reactions in the chemistry that happens in a cell. 
there's a lot of things that happen in a cell that aren't really reactions, like something could bind to DNA and affect the way genes are expressed. And in addition, there's also a lot of reactions that we don't understand well in the cell. And so these models necessarily only include a fraction of the reactions in genes. And so it's kind of like we're looking at just the corner of the game of the Go board. And that's not enough to do the reinforcement learning techniques. Additionally, these models are steady state and linear. The matrix I'm showing is a se specifying that system of linear equations. And there's no time component. So we're really just looking at a snapshot in time. As a consequence, we can't simulate the way a cell grows and divides or the way a culture expands in a volume of liquid. And that means we can't simulate what's happening at scale, the most important condition for us. Nonetheless, these features are still very helpful and they're working. So we're able to actively combine these flux type features with the experimental results on strain performance and we're generating models that are yielding useful recommendations, which for context could be something like removing a gene that's harmful for the production of your chemical. I wanted to highlight that all these maps that I've been showing are built using another Python package that's been great. It's called Escher. Escher is built in Python and it really does a lot of the D3 work for us. And uh, it, Escher has really good understanding of what these metabolic models are. And so there's an editor where you can construct these maps for different chemicals you're interested in. And it has lots of tooling built in to help you contextualize features you would extract from these types of networks. You can give it a try on GitHub um, without installing anything. You can play with their interface and pretend you're a metabolic engineer. So we only had time today to talk about features derived from metabolism, but there are many other types we can draw from for biology, and they're all important for achieving our machine learning goals. There's gene ontologies, which are human interpretable categories of gene function that are organized into directed acyclic graphs. There's regulatory networks that describe how cells change their gene expression patterns in response as they grow or as they're experiencing changes in their environmental conditions. There's the raw genome itself, which is rich with sequence features and also contains information about how the genes are arranged. There's also phylogenetic relationships, which describe um, relationships between organisms in evolutionary time and also how different proteins or how the same protein in different organisms are related. We also can use gene expression data. And I highlighted how Python has this package CobraPy for that one case of features, but there are excellent open source Python packages that we can use to extract features from all of these. Um, some of them are named here. So that's all I have today, and I really wanted to thank you all for two things. First, can anyone raise their hand if they've contributed to materials that help teach new programmers? Awesome, thank you. So this picture is me a few years ago in the middle of my PhD, and I was doing this kind of genetic engineering for renewable chemicals entirely by hand. Um, and with a lot of long days and weekends in the lab, I came to understand that computer science and data science are really the way forward for, for this field. And with the help of the tools and resources such as you've all built, um, I was able to pivot really quite quickly into a full-time data scientist. So thank you to anyone who's helped with the education of newer programmers. I also wanted to thank anyone who's contributed to open source packages. Raise their hand if that's you. Oh, even more, awesome. So I showed a number of the packages that we use at, at Zymergen, but there's also many under the hood as well. And like we have so much appreciation for all of the tooling you all have built. So thank you so much for those of you who've done that. Um, and so with that, that's all I have. I'm Janet Matson. Um, please reach out to me if you'd like to keep talking about this. Lunch is next, so we could talk a long time if you want. Um, yeah, and also please reach out if you're interested in Zymergen as an employer. We have a lot of amazing work to do, and there's people with all backgrounds. In fact, I think more of the technology background comes from traditional technology rather than science like myself. So please reach out if you're interested in the potential of working with us. Thank you.